the conservation movement didn't really begin in Australia. It began in the new world of uh, America when the, uh, with the movement to establish the um, Yellowstone National Park. And one of the movers and shakers behind that was uh, uh, John Muir. And to him is attributed a lot of the foundations of the conservation movement. Although the Sierra Club continued after that to be concerned only with setting aside land. We had other organisations in Australia uh, who followed suit. So we ended up with the National Park Associations in each of the states of Australia. We ended up with a lot of naturalist, field naturalist clubs. And most of these were concerned with examining the environment and the natural history, but not with advocating the preservation and uh, protection of it uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a formidable way. Uh, and many of these followed the example of the Audubon Society, which has also had a, uh, a very long history in the United States, and it was a field naturalist group. There have been three big transitions. One was the uh, involvement of gunpowder. And once gunpowder became involved, war became even more terrifying. Uh, then we had the uh, more recent, uh, in the 20th century, the mechanisation of war. But it was the mechanisation of war that also mechanised the destruction of the environment. And the pace of the destruction of the environment that uh, occurred during the 20th century is just absolutely unprecedented. And it will never be exceeded because there's not that much left to destroy. So it was after the Second World War that we started to get uh, more concern about the, what was going to happen to the environment. And you can see the invention of the chainsaw didn't exist. When you compare, I think there was something like so many 10 billion trees in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, when white people arrived in Australia. In the first uh, 100 years, they cleared 1 billion. Up until the Second World War, there was, there was only a fraction of the amount of clearing that's occurred in the Murray-Darling Basin, now the food bowl of Australia. And uh, it, most of it has gone since. You don't notice wildlife going. We now have such efficient methods of harvesting the country and exploiting it that the, as soon as the grass starts to grow, the road trains move in herds of cattle, they graze the country down, there's no seeds for the, any of the seed-eating birds, and uh, they've almost disappeared. In 1963, 62, things started to change. While we started the conservation movement in Australia with the Wildlife Preservation Society starting to be an advocacy group, um, we also, soon after that, that was followed by the uh, Australian Conservation Foundation, the World Wildlife Fund, and uh, uh, we've started to get much more advocating for the environment. Um, but at the same time, you had other movements happening, the progressive uh, movements for civil rights, for racial equality, for the women's movement, and the consumer rights movements, all evolved at about the, and all had their birth at about the same time during the early 1960s. At about the same time as these things were happening, the, the public consciousness was awakening in other ways. Uh, during the 1960s, um, polit politicians were receiving so many petitions about kangaroo shooting, about air pollution, and about water pollution, they held parliamentary commissions, uh, committees on each of them, select committee hearings. And they were very, very uh, in, uh, important because it made the Commonwealth Government realise that it should take some active uh, role in this because almost all of the issues that it was dealing with were matters to be handled by the state. So the Commonwealth decided it would participate in the Stockholm con uh, Convention in uh, a con conference in uh, 1972 and later that year it participated in the uh, con conference to bring about the World Heritage Convention. It signed, uh, it ratified both of those treaties. One brought about the formation of UNEP, and that particular, those particular signings, which were done under the McMahon government, enabled the Commonwealth to establish a federal environment minister, 
and the Commonwealth started to assume uh, responsibility for the environment. There were two very, very significant conservation battles occurring. Uh, and the longest running of them is the Great Barrier Reef. And the second was the Lake Petter drama. Now you've heard about Judith Wright and uh, the part that she played. Uh, she was just an, a marvellous person and uh, a wonderful friend to have. Uh, but she, a, a co-founder, she wasn't, didn't do it single-handedly, this society, the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland. This first battle that she led was on the uh, Big Bang campaign, was on the battle for the Great Barrier Reef, and she's written a book about it, Coral Battlegrounds, which you'll probably all uh, be familiar with. But she also had other visions. I mean, we've just discussed climate change, but Judith Wright was aware of the impact of the uh, damage to the ozone layer in the 1960s, when it was just not even in my thinking. And uh, Judith was raging and the Wildlife Preservation Society, a, an active campaign to prevent the Concord supersonic airliners ever getting up and becoming part of our uh, national transport system. The consciousness was first raised over the proposal uh, to quarry limestone off Ellison Reef off uh, Innisfail. And luckily, the Wildlife Preservation Society had just established itself in Innisfail it only lived for a few years up there at the time, but uh, uh, it was started by, and the cause was taken up by John Buist, who happened to be, and this was the power of the voluntary conservation movement, is it's got networks. John Buist went to school with Harold Holt, and that started the, uh, uh, the whole movement of the Royal Commission on um, the Great Barrier Reef, which led to the creation of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the uh, stopping of the drilling of the Great Barrier Reef. But one of the things that I need to point out is that in the battles of conservation, we don't always get victories. In fact, it's almost impossible to get a victory because if you, ha if you win some campaigns, there's always the opportunity that somebody else can come along at some stage in the future, revive the competition, and if there's nobody there willing to take up the cause a second time, a third time, a fourth time or more, it goes. We can only lose conservation battles, we can never permanently win them. And that's something that we need to stress and uh, have people to understand because once the environment's destroyed, it can't be put back easily together again.